Father, this morning we celebrate your amazing love for us. A love that, that values us, that, that will not forsake us. A love that pursued us from heaven, laying aside your glory to come and be a servant. To sacrifice yourself on the cross for us, for me. And Lord, this morning we want to know intimately your amazing love. We want to encounter your powerful truth and we want to be changed. So let us hear your voice and give us the courage and the faith to follow you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is Shelly and this is my journey to freedom. I am a recovered drug addict. I used drugs, mostly methamphetamine, for about 28 years. Um, at least 15 of those years was intravenous drug use. It started when I was about 12. My family um, had gotten involved in a cult. It was um, a very abusive and um, destructive and just a very scary place for uh, a young girl. When they finally pulled me out of there and sent me to public school, I, I really just, I didn't know how to fit in. I had had no contact with the outside world from fifth to eighth grade, so I had no idea how to fit in. So I, I, I used drugs, and drugs is how I fit in. And um, that started a pattern in my life of doing anything and everything I could just to fit in. And that continued on. Um, for the next 28 years until, um, until uh, by the grace of God, I met someone who had, who had been to Celebrate Recovery and introduced me to Celebrate Recovery. And so um, I decided to check it out and uh, I was scared and I was angry at God and I didn't really want to have anything to do with anything that was with a church because that meant bad things to me. So, um, I gave it a shot and the people there had the same story as me. And I thought, well, I can try this. Maybe I'll try this. But I, I wasn't really ready yet. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I was trying to impress somebody. So I signed up for this thing called the step study and I didn't even know what it was. And then um, I went on about my business and I went back out there and I was doing my thing. And I was, you know, um, back in my addiction and the phone rang. And it was this girl from the step study, and she said, Hi, my name is Denise, and I'm wondering if you still want to, you know, be in the step study. And I, I was like, God just called. I have to go. And that was the last day I used drugs. And that was June 11th, 2010. Through Celebrate Recovery and a lot of prayer and the step studies, I've been able to make amends with my children my ex-husband, all my family members that I hurt the whole time I was in my addiction. Um, I've been able to forgive a lot of people that I went to church with back in that, that cult situation and understand that they too were caught up in something. And I only, only was able to come to that realization through, you know, with God, with God's help because um, I certainly couldn't have done it on my own. Now I'm a leader in Celebrate Recovery, and I participate in a jail ministry, and um, I lead a step study, and this is all amazing, amazing things that I get to help help other people in their journey towards freedom, and and I get way more back than I give, and that's that's for sure. The hardest part, um, the worst part is, um, you know that I hurt my children, that I wasn't there for them, and I knew better. You know, but the drugs numbed it all out, and I, I just couldn't think straight, and I didn't, I just didn't even see what I was doing, and, and that was, that was bad, and that was hard, you know, and now, by the grace of God, thank God, um, they've forgiven me, and we have a good relationship, and it amazes me every day, <clears throat> and uh, my parents totally um, support me, love me, they think I'm amazing. Everyone that um, I hurt now just looks at me and they're proud. And, and that has to be God because I kind of did that by myself. Uh, I so much love those stories of the, of the journeys to freedom. I appreciate Shelly 
sharing hers with us as along with all the others over this series um, and uh, hope you have appreciated hearing how God has changed their lives. Fear is the greatest obstacle <clears throat> on the journey to freedom. If we follow Jesus Christ as he leads us on this journey to freedom, uh, we're going to encounter struggles and trials and difficulties and crises, but none of them are as deadly as fear. Uh, that, that's why a recurring theme in Scripture from the beginning to the end is simply do not be afraid. God was talking to Abraham, the patriarch of the nation of Israel, our father by faith. Uh, and, and he said to Abraham, do not be afraid, I am your shield. To his son Isaac, he said, do not be afraid, I am with you. When Joshua took over from, from Moses and led the children of Israel into the promised land, uh, God said, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for I am with you wherever you go. King David, who was known for killing giants, said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. The prophet Isaiah said, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. And we think about the Christmas story. And in the Christmas story, we sometimes lose the message in all the sentimentality and all the familiarity. But the angel came to, to Mary and he said, do not be afraid. You have found favor with God. To Joseph, the angel said, fear not to take Mary as your wife. And of course, to the shepherds, the angel said, fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you this day is born a Savior. He is Christ the Lord. When Jesus walked this earth, it was a theme in his teaching. He said to his disciples, right after he calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee, the wind and the waves, peace be still. He said to them, why do you have so little faith? Why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And then Jesus taught us and he said, do not fear those who can kill the body. But rather fear him who has the authority to cast both body and soul into hell. When the women went to the tomb on that Easter morning to anoint the body of Jesus, they got there and the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. He is not here. He is risen. And when Jesus met those women on their way back from the tomb, he said, Greetings. Do not be afraid. God knew that fear would paralyze us and prevent us from making the journey to freedom. And so over and over again, his message to us is simply this. Fear not. Do not be afraid. Because fear leads to failure. For us, and it led to failure for the Israelites. We see this dramatically exposed in the Exodus event. I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14. And yes, there is a book in the Bible called Numbers, and it has words in it. Just saying. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, grab one of the Bibles in the pews. They look just like this. Turn to page 154. You will find Numbers, chapter 13 and 14 there on page 154 and 55. While you're finding Numbers, let me catch up on the story. Our story takes place 14 months after the Israelites have left Egypt. Uh, God set them free through the plagues. They've had the Red Sea. They've gone to the Mount Sinai. They met God there. He, he gave them the Ten Commandments. Uh, they built a tabernacle to worship God. And now they have traveled to the edge of the promised land. This is the land that God had promised to give to Abraham over 500 years before. And now they're on the edge of it, and they can see it, and they can like, oh, we got to check this out. So they, they take one leader from each of the 12 tribes. So there's 12 men, and they say, okay, we're going to send these guys in, and they're going to scout out the land. They're spies. They're going to check it out. And, and so the 12 men go in. They spend 40 days checking out the land. They come back, and they report on what they've seen. And they all agree, all 12 of them agree, the land is excellent. The people are powerful, and the cities are fortified. And then Caleb, one of the twelve, he advocates for them to take 
the land. Chapter 13, verse 30 says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. He says, Come on, we can do this. But 10 of the men who went, 10 of the spies, had a different idea. Verse 31 says, And the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone to spy it out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all of the people that we saw in it are of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. So the spies uh, say, we can't do this. The people rebel. They start saying, let's go back to Egypt. We're better off in captivity. And uh, Caleb and Joshua try to persuade the people to listen to God, to act in faith instead of fear. Look at chapter 14, verses 8 and 9. Moses and Aaron, man, they're, they're wanting people to, to listen to God. They fall on their face. They're praying for the people. Joshua and Caleb, Joshua's the other one of the spies, they try to convince them. Listen to what they say, verse 8, 14. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Well, the people don't listen to Joshua and Caleb. They decide they're going to kill Moses and go back to Egypt. And so they pick up the rocks like they're going to stone Moses and all the people with Moses, and God shows up. I mean, he's always there, but he literally showed up, he, he, and his cloud of glory descended between Moses and the people, and Moses and God have a conversation. And God kind of tests Moses' faithfulness. He goes, Moses, why don't I kill all these faithless people and start over with you? And Moses passed the test. He kind of went, no, let's not do that. Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't want to be that, that guy who says kill them all and let God sort them out. And uh, so God intervenes and he disciplines the people. He tells the people, the Israelites, you're going to die in the wilderness. You chose not to go into the promised land and every male who's 20 years old enough is going to die in this desert. You're not going to get to go in the promised land. You're going to wander for 40 years. The 10 leaders, the spies who gave the bad report, they died that day. And uh, we see in their example that fear leads to failure. Fear led to failure for the Israelites, and for you and for me, fear leads us to failure. Because fear is the greatest obstacle on the journey to freedom. And, and that's because fear blinds us to God's power. Fear blinds us to God's power. The Israelites, think about what they had seen and experienced the last 14 months. They had lived through the 10 plagues that had got their freedom. They'd seen God deliver them through the Red Sea when he parted the Red Sea. They, they had experienced uh, miraculous water and food every single day of those 14 months. God had provided for them. They had received the Ten Commandments. They had seen Moses come down from the Mount Sinai. His face was glowing. I mean, that's kind of cool, isn't it? I mean, the pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. And they knew that God was with them and he'd given them military victory. And here they are on the edge of this land and these spies go, we can't do it. And the people forget all the things that God has done. They forget the power of God because of their fear. Oh, the, the people, the people are powerful. Really, more than the Egyptian army? I don't think so. Well, the cities are fortified. We can't take them. Okay, you're talking about a God who divided a body of water. You think a city is going to be able to handle him? No. God is inviting us to open our eyes to his power and to trust it. God wants us to see his power to save, his power to heal, his power to forgive and to restore that's why the Apostle Paul declared, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, beginning with the Jews and extending to all the Gentiles. That's why we show you the testimonies. 
We want you to hear the stories of people just like you whom God has changed their lives and has restored their lives and has picked up the broken pieces of their lives and put them together in a beautiful way. We want you to see that so that you can understand that God has the power to change your life. Because our fear blinds us to God's power. But faith trusts God and believes in his power to save. So fear blinds us to God's power and fear causes us to crave captivity. Look at four, uh, chapter 14, beginning at verse 2. This is after the congregation uh, of the people have heard this bad report and it says this, and, and all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt. Or would that we had died in this wilderness. God answers that prayer. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Uh, they want to return to captivity. Now, just a couple of years before this, they're begging God, save us from captivity. The, the Egyptians are so mean to us. Please deliver us. And God shows up and delivers them. And they want to go back. We are tempted to selectively remember the good old days, aren't we? You ever hung out with people who want to talk about the good old days and how wonderful the good old days were? And, and the truth is the comfort and security of how things used to be is a lie. Because if we're honest about the good old days, we had the same struggles that we have today back then. Because the world was not really a safer, more wonderful, peaceful place 50 years ago. Can I just tell you this, and I don't remember, but I know that some of you do. They used to have this thing in school where, you know, they teach the kids to duck and cover. You know what that means? That means, hey, if somebody drops a nuclear bomb on us, hide under your desk. It'll be good. <laughs> yeah, so let's try that. But see, the world was no different. There was fear. There was threats. There was violence. There was hatred. And, and it's going to be that way until Jesus comes again. So, you know, we can look back and pretend that, all oh, the good old days were wonderful. But they were still captivity. And sometimes we lament. We think, can't we just go back to how it used to be? No. And if you could miraculously go back to how it used to be, you'd be miserable there too. You see, we cannot move forward if we're looking back. If we're looking back. I mean, you can try for a little while, but you're going to fall down quickly. And God wants to lead us to a future and a hope. He wants to take us someplace where he's going to bless us. And we have to let go of the past so that we can go forward with him. And it doesn't matter why you're fixated on the past. It doesn't matter what you're looking back. Maybe, maybe the past was your glory days of success and triumph. And you were the, you know, it was all, you were wonderful and, and everything. And you want to go back because you want to recapture that glory. Or, or maybe the... The past holds pain and suffering and, and brokenness for you. And you can't let go of it. And you're still fixated on the people that hurt you and, and what happened to you. Either way, it's still captivity. And God is calling us forward. Jesus wants us to follow him into the promised land of freedom. And he's going to bless us because he's got better plans for us ahead than whatever the past held for us. You see, fear causes us to crave captivity. But faith gives us the courage to follow Jesus because he's got something better for us if we follow him. So fear causes us to crave captivity and fear undermines our faith. It undermines our faith. The spies returned with a good report. And Caleb challenged him. He said, hey, we can do this. God is with us. We can take this land. This is the next step on our journey to freedom. God is with us and we will succeed. Did, did you catch what he said in chapter 14? I love this. He said, the people are bread to us. You know what he's saying? We're going to eat them alive. <laughs> this is so cool. God is with us. And if God's with us, who can be against us? Doesn't matter. We've got this. But then the 10 
said, no, we can't. They are big people. We're just like little bugs to them. They're going to squash us and we're going to lose and our kids are going to become captives and it's just going to be terrible. And fear led the people to rebel against God. Fear led them to reject the promises of God and the freedom that God wanted to give them and they wanted to go back to captivity. Fear undermines our faith. So what are you afraid of? What fear is stopping you from following God? And when I talk about what are you afraid of, I don't mean you know, the normal stuff like spiders and snakes and the dark and all that kind of stuff. What are the fears that Satan is whispering into your mind, into your soul, that are preventing you from following God? Are you afraid of failure again? Because all of us in this room have failed at something. Are you afraid of taking a risk, of taking a chance? Because what if you fail? You know, if you're afraid of failure, you'll never discover the things that God has for you because he doesn't tell you what they're going to be before you experience them. He wants you to trust him and follow him and to take that risk to believe that he's with you and he's going to guide you. Are you afraid of discovery? Are you sitting here today and hoping that people don't find out who you really are because you're afraid that if they find out who you really are and how you've really messed up and, and all that kind of stuff that they'll reject you? Haven't you figured out by now that this is a safe place, that we're not a place of condemnation, that we're a place of grace and, and we don't really care what mistakes you've made? I mean, have you guys noticed that we share testimonies of people whose lives were a mess? And they're not like people that we lock away in a room someplace and just let out to video. These are leaders in this congregation. And, and, and we're not afraid to admit that we all have mistakes and we've all, you know, messed up. So, so what are you hiding from? Don't let the shame and the embarrassment and the guilt keep you in captivity. Christ wants to set you free, and, and sometimes that just means letting people know who you are, telling them your story. And no, you can tell them quietly. You don't have to put it up here. Although if I hear it, and it's a good one, I'll ask. Um, are you afraid of change? Because it's impossible to follow Jesus and stay the same. He's going to ask you to change your values, change the things that you do, the habits, the the addictions. He's going to ask you to change. Are you afraid of pain or suffering or death? I mean, that stuff's real and it's not pleasant, but here's the thing. If you're a follower of Christ, the promises of God mean that it only gets better. It only gets better because heaven is our destination. We get new bodies, new life that, that isn't touched by this stuff. Are you afraid of the loss of control? You know, there's a lot of parents with kids at home who are trying to control their lives and control their kids' lives, and you're afraid of losing control. Let me just help you out a little bit. You're not in control. It's an illusion that you are creating and trying to tell yourself, okay, i got to control this. Control. No, just let go, because the only thing that you really control is your own choices, and we're not so good at that, are we? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of success? That, that you're going to follow Christ and he's going to bless you and then people are going to actually expect you to do it again. You see, whatever your fear, if we surrender to our fears, we can't make it to freedom. That's why fear is so dangerous on our journey. And I got to tell you, there are fear mongers all around us. In our midst, people who are always prophesying doom and gloom, and they're warning us of impending demise. I mean, just read, you know, blogs and, and news on the internet. There's always those people saying it's all about to end, it's going to get bad. And by the way, there's people who make money at that. You just need to know it. That, that's why all the people who bought the stuff for Y2K are selling it now to the preppers. Uh, <laughs> it's just the next iteration of fear. Every time I've gone on a mission trip, people say, aren't you afraid? What if something happens? What if you die? Last time I checked, God knew all of my days before one of them came to be. And he's already promised me that I will die. Because it's, you know, one of those things that's appointed unto man once to die and then face judgment. I don't have to worry about judgment because Jesus has already forgiven me. So, you know, that's part of the reality. But... 
but the thing is, if I give in to fear and I don't go because something might happen, then I miss out on God's blessings. See, that's fear. Every time we've done a building project, people speak fear. Oh, what if you don't have enough money? What if you can't get done? What if it all goes wrong? What if people get angry? It's okay, but what are we going to do? If God blesses us, don't we trust him to take care of us if we're good stewards? And there's people who just are afraid because they want to talk about what if everything goes wrong in our nation? What if everything happens? What if bad stuff goes, you know, and everything falls apart? Okay, last time I checked, I'm not in control of that. And neither are you. And if everything goes crazy, guess what? God's still with us, and he's still redeeming our lives, and it only gets better at some point. You see, we are to be people of faith, not people of fear. But I, I got to point this out, because some of you like to be the fear mongers. Some of you like to be the, the doom and gloom prophets. And you need to see what happened with the 10 guys that were spreading the bad report and encouraging fear. Numbers chapter 14, verse 36 and 37. It says, And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land, the men who brought up a bad report of the land died by plague before the Lord. <laughs> God killed them. Now think about this. It wasn't kind of a small thing that they did. They actually led the entire nation to rebel against God. They encouraged fear instead of faith in trusting God. And they led the people to want to go back to captivity. And that's serious stuff. Every one of us in this room has influence. Every one of us in this room is leading someone. Are you leading them in faith? Or are you leading them in fear? Parents, are your kids getting faith from you or are they getting fear from you? Husbands, are your wives getting faith from you or fear from you? Are your friends, evident, you know, are they, are they picking up the vibes of fear out of your life? Or are they being encouraged to trust God? Fear undermines our faith. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you have made a personal commitment to follow Jesus, I want to talk about your options. Because uh, you've got choices to make so that when you walk out the doors today, you're going to decide how you're going to live your life. And I want to mention three options. Only two of them are really viable for followers of Christ. But I want to mention them anyway. The first option that you have is to live in freedom. To follow Jesus in faith. To trust God. To provide for you. To lead you. To heal you. To deliver you. This means that you daily make a decision to surrender to Jesus. Because the more that you give of your will over to him, the more that you embrace his values and his life and his way, the freer you become. I know it's counterintuitive, it doesn't make sense, but the more you surrender to Jesus, the freer you become. That's why we put this verse up here after every testimony. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So you can choose... To walk in freedom, saying, Jesus, I want to learn. I'm going to follow you. Teach me how to do that. I'm going to surrender more to you. By the way, this is a process. It doesn't happen instantaneously most of the time. That's why we call this series Journey to Freedom and not Moment to Freedom. <laughs> okay, we're just being honest about it. It's a process. It's a, it's a journey. So you've got to make that commitment. And day in, day out, you've got to surrender to Jesus. That's freedom. One choice is freedom. Second choice, second option, which really is a false option, is captivity. You see, the Israelites wanted to go back to e Egypt. They couldn't do that. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if, if Christ has set you free, then you can't go back to being a captive. Because your life has been changed by Jesus. And, and, and you belong to him. And he's thrown open the doors. He's broken the chains. And you can't go back to living as a captive. Now, you can go back to your old lifestyle. And you can check it out. You can, you can slip back into your old addictions and your habits and your destructive patterns. But here's the thing. It won't be the same. It won't be the same. Because now you got company. Because when you follow Jesus, he put the Holy Spirit in you. And part of the Holy Spirit's job is to convict of sin. And so when you go back to that old lifestyle, that old stuff, try to live like a captive, the Holy Spirit's like, hey, 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 what are you doing? 
That's right. His job is to annoy you so that it's not any fun anymore. It's, it's what convicted of sin looks like. And so he's going to remind you, you don't want to do that. And, you, and as soon as you get done, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. That's terrible. And, and, and it's not going to be the same. You can't really live as a captive when Christ has set you free. Now, there may be some of you here that are living in captivity because you've never chosen to follow Jesus. And if that's the case, then I want to encourage you today to make that choice. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you ask Christ to change your life, if you surrender to him, he will change you and he will set you free. And you can begin that journey to freedom. But if you're a follower of Christ, the reality is this. If you don't choose to live in freedom, then you choose to live in the wilderness. That was the Israelites' result. They rejected the promised land that God wanted to give them. What was their result? Wilderness. What does the wilderness look like with us? Well, God is with you. He's not going to abandon you, but you're not living in what he planned for you. You're missing out on the blessings that he wants to give to you. God is with you, but it's a mundane, tedious, tasteless, joyless kind of life. I mean, there's moments of celebration, but it kind of gets back to the tedium. If you're living in fear, you're wandering in the wilderness. And today, Jesus calls you to courage. He calls you to surrender to him, to follow him into the promised land of freedom. And, and no matter how many times you've stumbled back into the wilderness, he's calling you back to freedom. That's what the grace of God is all about. And unlike the Israelites, this is kind of cool, none of us have to die in the wilderness. We can leave the wilderness at any moment we choose to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to confront my fear, and I want you to, I'm going to confess it. I'm going to tell people about my fear, and I, and I want you to help me to overcome it because I want to live free, and I want a journey to freedom. But he gives us the choice, the option. So will you follow Christ in faith? Or are you going to wander in fear? No one can decide for you. You get to decide for yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. And thank you for calling us to freedom. And Lord, you want us to walk by faith, not by sight. And so often we're drawn back to captivity. We, we wander in the wilderness and we're missing out on the blessings that you have for us. So God, today, teach us how to confront our fears. Teach us how to grow in faith. Give us the courage to follow you even when we're not sure where you're leading. Because we know that you always lead best. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand and worship our God together.